everyone we'll just wait a bit. we'll wait a little bit uh, for people to join Okay, good, good afternoon, good morning, uh, good evening perhaps too, Jayati as well. Um, we're waiting for Jeff uh, Sachs to join, but I think we'll, we'll kick off partly because Jose Antonio has um, his day job to worry about a little bit. Um, my name is Richard Kozel Wright. Uh, this is an UNCTAD seminar based around uh, last year's trade and, or this year's trade and development report uh, for a discussion on the state of the global economy uh, prospects and where we think uh, we are heading over the coming uh, few, few months. Um, I have a great panel with um, uh, some important speakers and I don't want to spend a lot of time uh, going through uh, the details, I should I should just say that any question we'll try for a Q and A at the end of the meeting. So please, if you have any questions, put them into the chat. Um, let me let me try and uh, let me just kick off by setting the scene in terms of of what the trade and development report uh, are some of the the main points from from the trade and development report of this year, and then we'll go into a, 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 a presentations by by the panelists. Um, this year's TDR, I guess, was an attempt to respond to what we sh we saw as the shift in the global narrative from and a very, a very rapid shift, really, from a whole discussion about build a building back better uh, world that people were talking about uh, through a lot of uh, last year um, to a kind of gloom and doom scenarios around the emergence of stagflationary pressures in the global economy. Um, there was a policy reversion as a consequence of that to what, after what seemed to be a fairly um, uh, radical set of policy proposals that were being made during COVID to a much more business as usual approach. Uh, central banks uh, regained the reins of policy making. Um, and there was a singular focus on inflationary pressures as inflation began to build, particularly in the advanced economies. Um, central bankers have a singular view of inflation. It's always too much money chasing too few goods. And the, and the way to respond to that is through monetary tightening. And there was a sharp monetary tight, tight, tightening beginning in the middle of 2021. Um, from a low level, but a sharp tightening. And we were concerned about the consequences of that um, for a number of reasons. First of all, because we saw it as a costly response to the inflation problem. Uh, we didn't see the conditions for a soft landing. Uh, the evidence suggests that uh, coming out of a period of very low inflation and high debt is, it does not provide the kind of uh, conditions to uh, make a, a soft landing. And there was lots of evidence that inflation was gonna peak in the last quarter of, um, of, of this year anyway. And for those that read the Financial Times this morning, there's a large piece in the FT that tends to suggest that inflation is beginning to peak in, in advanced economies. Um, we also worry particularly that this was looking to be a very challenging environment for developing countries, having accumulated a considerable amount of debt following the global financial crisis and during uh, COVID-19. COVID and so, so there were real concerns about the sustainability question uh, facing developing countries. Um, and we also saw that there were better responses to uh, inflation that comes from the supply side. And, and at least in our analysis, most of the uh, inflationary pressures were due to supply shocks rather than uh, coming from, from the demand side of the economy. And there were better ways of, of dealing with that than simply to uh, tighten monetary policy uh, very rapidly. And given that much of the narrative around that we, that we were hearing at the time was based on the assumption uh, that 
uh, on the dangers of a wage price spiral catching hold, uh, we didn't see very li uh, much evidence of uh, such spirals in the advanced economies. And if anything, there was much, much greater evidence that there was a kind of profit uh, uh, price spiral emerging as markups uh, began to increase significantly in key sectors, key sectors of the economy. So, so we were, we were, the, the report sets out uh, that argument in some detail um, at the international level that tended to suggest to us an ongoing concern we've had about the lack of policy coordination at the international level um, and a long-standing failure to deal with some of the structural issues around a highly financialized economy uh, reforms that were promised after the global uh, uh, global financial crisis and and never emerged so the inflation story we we, at least in, the, this, in our trade and development report, pushed back against what we would see as the consensus coming out of central banks. Um, in terms of growth, I mean, obviously, like everybody else, we charted a worsening condition across the global economy, um, but with a particular concern for the vulnerabilities of, of developing countries. Um, the, I think a point we wanted to make strongly was, and, and people seem to forget, the previous decade, and particularly the last five years of the last decade, were not good for developing countries. Growth slowed rapidly, debt was building up. By the end of the, of the last decade, there were real signs of fragilities and, and, and distress in a number of uh, 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 developing countries. Um, and and COVID-19 was, for many parts of the develop, developing world, a harder shock than was the global financial crisis. So there were real pressures already building up um, across the developing world as uh, higher interest rates uh, tended to lead to a more rapid slowdown in the global economy than had been expected at the beginning of uh, uh, 2022. Um, of course, the recovery from the, from the COVID-19 crisis had been a very uneven one. Uh, developing countries faced ongoing uh, uh, constraints on the external balance and fiscal space was was being consider considerably uh, squeezed uh, over the previous 18 months. So the, the, the potential for recovery in the developing world had been uh, weak and the multilateral response had been woefully insufficient, whether that was the debt service suspension initiative or other um, uh, efforts uh, from, from the international community to deal with the, uh, the crisis had not been adequate to help developing countries get through that crisis in a, in a more uh, timely and, and, measured, uh, and measured fashion. Um, of course, not, not surprisingly, we have highlighted the, the problem of debt distress in developing countries uh, uh, over the last 12 months. We raise the concern of a potential lost decade. I think it's an interesting question that we should have about what we mean by a lost decade. Maybe it's a lost decade that looks less like the 1980s lost decade and more like what some people are seeing as a lost decade in Latin America after the global financial crisis where growth has been particularly slow and investment has been uh, particularly weak. Uh, so, so I think that's an that was a but a lost decade is a real fear that we have in UNCTAD, given the kinds of pressures and challenges that developing countries are going to be facing over the next uh, five or six years. And that I, I think the last point that we had uh, that we wanted to make in the report was that um, we do need a different policy narrative coming out of this crisis than the one that we've been seeing uh, evolve over the last. Uh, 12 months. And at the heart, I think, of a different policy analysis is a need to recognize that we are living through what we would see as an investment crisis, yeah, it, not only in developed countries, but, uh, uh, but also in developing countries. Uh, I think it's, a, it's not been sufficiently recognized that capital formation has been weak across the global economy over the last decade. And given that the initiatives that we are all backing, whether that's in the climate context or in the context of the Agenda 2030, in one way or another imply a big investment push. Um, the need to understand why we're facing uh, a serious investment crisis, I think, is something that, that has received insufficient attention amongst policymakers in both advanced 
and developing countries and the need for a different kind of narrative, policy narrative to address that crisis is fundamental, I think, to move to making progress uh, uh, over, the coming, over the coming decade. So that's the kind of broad landscape that we were trying to set out. Welcome, Jeff. I, I, I just gave a very brief intro to some of the themes from the from the trade and development report that I hope will trigger some response from from the from our three panelists. And so I, I will turn to you now. I, I think I'll start, Jeff, with you. I, um, I'm not, Jeff Sachs is the director of the Center for Sustainable Development at the Earth Institute at Columbia University, amongst many other uh, attributes. And I'm, I'm not going to go through all your achievements, Jeff. That would take us uh, too long. One I might remind you of, though, is that it's almost 40 years since you wrote with um, uh, Michael Bordeaux the uh, economics of worldwide stagflation. And given that the narrative now is all about stagflation, I thought you might be the best person to kick off on where you think we are in terms of the health of the global economy. And in particular, of course, the role of the United States and the way that you see that evolving over the coming, over the coming months. It's almost certain that the Fed will tighten again I think next month, which raises all kinds of problems. At the same time, you've had the passing of the Inflation Reduction Act uh, by the Biden administration. Into it has to be said what looks like to be a, an increasingly divisive political domestic scene, all of which will have ramifications beyond the, the borders of the United States that we're going to have to come to terms with uh, in understanding the the, 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 the the progress of the global economy over the coming few months. So, Jeff. Great. What your take on this situation? Yeah, th th thank you very much. Let, let me talk about uh, a little bit about the stagflation and uh, more generally about the issue, Richard, that you raised about the investment <laughs> profile for the world. Um, we are in the first stagflation uh, for 40 years. Stagflation emerges from a combination of uh, monetary and fiscal expansion combined with uh, supply side shocks in the 1970s. Those supply side shocks were two oil crises uh, and a war in the Middle East. Uh, in our time, the supply side shocks uh, are the pandemic, uh, the war in Ukraine, the sanctions regime, uh, and the uh, US attempt to partly decouple the US economy from China. Uh, all of those are deeply disruptive of the international economy. On the uh, monetary and fiscal side, the response to the pandemic uh, in 2020 was uh, certainly the most extraordinary monetary and fiscal expansion in American modern economic history. The money supply went up several trillion dollars uh, and uh, the budget deficits were unprecedented in peacetime and so, we had a lot of uh, nominal uh, demand built up together with supply side disruptions. And uh, the first stagflation ended with uh, huge disruptions to the world economy, a generalized developing country debt crisis uh, starting in Latin America, but afterwards spreading to uh, almost the entire developing world. It took many years to get out of this mess and uh, we are at least uh, at risk of uh, a macroeconomic crisis uh, again, because uh, none of the major economies is uh, performing well. Uh, the pandemic is not over. The war in Ukraine is not over. Uh, the tensions in East Asia are not over. Um, and so we do not have any resolution on the supply side issues. And we also add in all of the environmental crises that were not a major theme of uh, that period, though there were actually, interestingly, massive uh, El Nino uh, events in 1973-74. But putting that aside, we now have chronic, deep environmental crises, droughts, floods, hurricanes, uh, typhoons, uh, um, heat waves that will put tremendous supply side pressure on uh, economies for years to come. That's the macro context. The broader context is that even before uh, 2020, 
uh, and all of these massive disruptions, we had enough problems. We were not achieving sustainable development, a safe climate, uh, the energy transformation, or anything else. And that comes to your broader point, which is that the investment agenda, um, sustainable development is an investment agenda, uh, and the investment agenda was not being satisfied. I think that there are uh, several reasons for that. Let me just state very briefly, I tend to see uh, s several uh, buckets of investment uh, that are at the core of our transformation needs, education, uh, health systems, uh, energy transformation, uh, agriculture transformation, or urban uh, infrastructure, digitalization, uh, climate adaptation, just to list seven of them quickly. They're all pretty big ticket items. They require uh, trillions of dollars if uh, combined per year. They are well out of the reach of the developing countries and uh, especially the low income and lower middle income countries, which together constitute half the world's population. We've never had a serious look at how to finance the goals that we have stated. Uh, the United States uh, has actively blocked any type of serious uh, financial analysis of these issues for the last 25 years. Uh, systematically, uh, when there have been international commissions, the role of the US representative is to look for voluntary market based solutions, uh, and to oppose uh, basically any public finance, uh, or international uh, policy finance solutions to these issues. The US uh, role in all of this is as a wannabe hegemonic power that doesn't want to share anything with the rest of the world. Uh, it's an incredibly selfish political economy inside the country and internationally. And it's still a powerful country. It's uh, oriented towards uh, military purposes, uh, whether it's NATO expansion or uh, creating an anti-China military alliance in Asia. It is not organized around sustainable development. And that's true even within the United States. We will have hurricane after hurricane after hurricane, and these governors of our states will oppose any climate action. Uh, this is a really perverse, deep-rooted Anglo-Saxon libertarianism that goes back about three centuries. And I won't get into all of the philosophical uh, and social roots of this, but it, it is a kind of perversity. Having said all of that, uh, the solutions globally uh, require uh, two main things in the rich countries, uh, attention to an agenda that they certainly can afford, and they certainly cannot afford not to uh, engage in. And, and that is the whole political economy issue of the United States. Uh, Europe has is far more consequent. Europe is far saner than the US, but probably mainly because it doesn't have fossil fuel. So it's able to think more clearly uh, than, than the United States in this regard. Uh, China is a obviously a crucial actor and uh, um, ambivalent about uh, much of this agenda, though I think on the whole, realizing that energy transformation, decarbonization and so forth is important. Uh, the Gulf countries can certainly afford transformation, and they are partly engaged and partly opposing what needs to be done and so forth. So part of the issue is not finance so much as organizational and political economy. Uh, is this agenda actually an agenda in which government purpose is going to be engaged? But for half the world, this is basically a financial uh, the, the, the let me put it this way finance is the limiting factor by far in the low income and lower middle income countries the global market financial system clearly does not deliver global saving to capital scarce poor countries at terms that are adequate for development this is one of the great puzzles of development economics uh, the United States pays 
basically zero or negative real interest rates for 30 year borrowing, but a developing country pays very high real rates. Or if you look at nominal rates, the US 30 year rate is say three and a half percent. In India, it's seven to eight percent. In Africa, it's 12 to 15 percent if it's available at all. So the whole scale of finance is tilted against development. Capital uh, runs uphill, not downhill. Uh, capital does not flow from the rich to the poor. This is a long theme of development economics that is, uh, to some extent, really an intellectual puzzle. These risk premia are not really even the default risk premia because studies have shown if you take 200 years, including defaults and all the rest, the cost of capital to poor countries is simply much higher than to richer countries. It's good to be rich, money comes to you. It's bad to be poor, money flows away from you, even though you're the one that has the higher marginal product. So uh, this is the essential issue, how to get finance to flow to low income and lower middle income countries. My own answer, Jeff, can I, because yeah. I want to come back to the answers in, oh, the, sure. in, in the next section. Let me turn sure. to Jose, no, because that's where we need to end up, I think. Okay, great. Um, and, I, and I want to turn to Jose Antonio, who is the Minister of Finance for Colombia, amongst other, uh, many other um, uh, activities that I think everyone knows about. Uh, and, and so let me just turn to, keep, to turn south in a way, Jose Antonio, particularly, I mean, literally in the case of the policy challenges that will face the Latin American region over the coming uh, uh, months and years. I mean, there's a striking difference, I think, between the global environment today from the global environment at the beginning of the 21st century, when again, we saw a tide of progressive governments uh, taking power in, in Latin, Latin America, a much more, a much more <laughs> difficult uh, global environment that will be faced, I think. Uh, by by policymakers in in your regions, I want in your region. I I wonder how you see the prospects ahead uh, uh, for 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 Latin America, the challenges that are being faced across the region, and again, particularly uh, ECLAC in their recent report made the point that invest getting the investment levels up in in, in Latin America has been a long standing challenge, and and where do you see the prospects or or, or challenges? Uh, in that regard uh, for policymakers in the region. Well, uh, well thank you very much, uh, uh, Richard. I'm delighted to be uh, with Ayatia and Jeff uh, in this uh, panel. Uh, uh, let me, I guess, concentrating on Latin America, say that the, uh, that the, uh, the recovery of Latin America uh, after the, uh, the pandemic uh, ha has been the weak, uh, is the weakest in the developing world. Uh, so so that's, a, a, that's a major challenge. It depends, uh, of course, on countries to countries. Uh, for example, my country, Colombia and Chile have been uh, you know, relatively well uh, compared to the others. Uh, but, uh, but overall, the, uh, the growth has been uh, weak. And, uh, and of course, Latin America is being uh, affected uh, also by, uh, by, uh, by this situation. So, it is suspected that the, uh, the growth will slow down uh, next year. Uh, uh, the, uh, for example, the most recent ECLAC estimate uh, is that uh, Latin America is growing at 3.1% this year, uh, but it will slow down to 1.3% uh, uh, with the negative growth in, in a few economies. So that's a, that's a general framework. At the same time, of course, uh, inflation is affecting uh, 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 or has affected all the economies. Uh, uh, although uh, I guess a couple of uh, uh, a couple of economies, at least particularly Brazil, uh, has been uh, you know uh, uh, have been experiencing a, a downward trend in inflation. Uh, so it's, it's a positive trend on their side. But one of the strongest uh, problems that uh, we all receive from the uh, global economy. Uh, along with what the uh, yeah, yeah, uh, excuse me, uh, uh, excuse me, uh, what Jeff just said is uh, international financing. Uh, the uh, the pressure on interest rates uh, that that we have been facing uh, is a major problem. 
uh, and, and, and this is, of course, associated in turn uh, with the, uh, the outflow of capital from emerging economies uh, that has been taking place. Uh, so the, the two factors together is, uh, indicate that uh, uh, there is a very little uh, a, you know, private financing, uh, international private financing, and, and what is available is relatively costly uh, by international standards. So the, uh, the, 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 now the, um, let's say the, uh, the uh, on the inflation side, let me say, of course, uh, that the, uh, a few countries are experiencing, uh, a, you know, positive terms of trade shocks. Uh, a, that depends very heavily on, on, on countries, uh, you know, commodities, uh, I mean, particularly oil uh, is an export, of course, of, of some economies, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, and, and those economies are experiencing in terms of trade uh, improvement, but many Latin American countries are oil importers, actually. Uh, so the, uh, the effect is negative for them. And also with food, uh, you know, the food prices, uh, uh, of course, uh, cereals uh, uh, generate a positive effect, let's say on Argentina or uh, Uruguay or Brazil, which are uh, important uh, food exporters, let's say. Uh, but in turn uh, generate a negative effect on those countries that are food importers. Uh, so so the, the, it's, a, it's a mixed uh, story um, uh, in that regard. Uh, now, in that context, uh, uh, of course, the, the, there are other uh, issues that uh, are important. Uh, uh, the, you know, Jeff mentions uh, uh, one of them. Uh, which is debt, and, and you also did, Richard, uh, in your initial presentation. So, so it's, it's a mixed story. Some countries do have debt problems. Argentina being probably the uh, <clears throat> the worst case in Latin America. Ecuador also has, you know, having other problems. And there are probably other countries that are facing a, a debt a, a problem. Uh, now, let's say <clears throat> on the, uh, uh, I mean, this short term. Uh, Situation uh, generated by this is the weak recovery uh, and the um, uh, from the pandemic and the slowdown that is expected for next year uh, also uh, implies that uh, Latin America is facing uh, a long term issue. Which uh, I actually uh, just before the pandemic, I actually wrote an op ed saying that Latin America had been already experiencing what I call a, a, a lost half decade. Uh, because in 2014, uh, the Latin America slowed down significantly. So the, by, you know, by the pandemic, before the pandemic, it was clear that the Latin America was facing it. Now, with the effects of the pandemic and the weak recovery after that, uh, I actually wrote another piece at the end of the, last year saying that Latin America was facing a, a new debt, a new lost decade. Uh, and uh, that's what the, uh, the, the new executive secretary of, uh, uh, of ECLAC, uh, Jose Manuel Salazar, just uh, said uh, yesterday to the Financial Times. Uh, so, the, uh, so we are in the midst of a, of a new lost decade and the question marks are, uh, uh, are you know, what to do. And let me say that in, in long-term trends, uh, the other effect that uh, we ha has already been mentioned uh, is uh, of course the effects of climate change, yeah. <clears throat> which, uh, uh, aside from the uh, challenges, let's say of, uh, of mitigation, the, the major problem is adaptation. Adaptation is a major problem for many economies, and uh, as well as the negative shock that we have received with the with the La Nina uh, in uh, in several countries. So that's a, a, a as well as the uh, again the problems of the. Uh, 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 or the you know uh, problems in the in the Pacific, let's say uh, weather events. So the so the the two things are together, uh, you know you know sig uh, generate significant challenges ahead. Uh, le let me uh, perhaps point out uh, uh, two issues and uh, 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 leave for the second round my views on the international system and what can be done for the international system. But the uh, uh, I think the uh, uh, the two major challenges for Latin America. Uh, is uh, is uh, the, the way to reindustrialize because the the, the lost decade uh, is is clearly associated to a long term deindustrialization trend that has happened in most countries, uh, notably South America. 
uh, and uh, you know, uh, uh, which is of course, uh, uh, um, you know, one of the factors generating this uh, uh, weak uh, uh, growth uh, associated in turn to a low productivity growth. So the so the major challenge uh, is how you uh, you industrialize with productivity growth. Uh, but also, and very importantly, uh, given the weakness of international trade, uh, uh, the uh, integration, the regional integration of, of Latin America <clears throat> is also a clear priority. Uh, and, and perhaps the, uh, you know, this uh, left wing, uh, let's say, uh, trends that we are experiencing uh, could be a way to, uh, to uh, let's say, to have positive effects on, on both fronts. So, so reindustrialization with the, the strong uh, productivity uh, you know, policies, let's say, science and technology policies. Uh, and uh, on the other hand, uh, <clears throat> uh, reintegration policies uh, which may be uh, a positive trend for the region. Let me stop here and, and give a second round of my thoughts on the international system. Okay, we'll, I think we'll come back to that. That's a, that sounds like a return to Raoul Prebisch to me, if it's about industrialization and regionalization. I've heard that one. I've heard that before coming from Antad. Um, so I'll come, but let me turn to Jayati. I'll give you the slightly enviable task, Jayati, of kind of covering the rest of the developing world, but particularly Asia. I mean, are there any positives? I mean, there are at least two countries that have a what look like respectable growth rates in Asia. That's true to some extent of India, and it's true of Indonesia. And then the people are putting a lot of um, hope on 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 new growth poles emerging in the Asian region. I don't know if you think that is overly uh, uh, optimistic. Africa, of course, has many of the problems that that have been already discussed, particularly in terms of uh, debt crisis and external constraints. Um, and, and I think that might lead us in, and I'll ask you then about your take on the multilateral responses, because I, all the problems that we're talking about require increased international cooperation, that's clear. And it's not clear that we have a multilateral system in that respect that is, is yet fit for purpose. But, but the, do you see any prospects in, in some of the uh, developing world to be a bit more optimistic? Wow. Well, first of all, you know, you've had already this really excellent overview of both the global uh, arrangements and Latin America and the problems it faces. I want to emphasize that, you know, the places that people see as the bright sparks, the growth poles, etc. It's often a problem of uh, really the fallacy of composition. In other words, India is seen as one of these promising places. Whereas if you look a little bit slightly more detail in terms of what's happening to the majority of the people in India, it's deeply alarming. We are facing a severe livelihood crisis. Employment rates are well below they were pre-COVID. Wage rates, nominal wage rates are well below what they were pre-COVID. In other words, for many categories of workers, they're getting two thirds the money wage they got before COVID when prices have gone up since then by about 20 to 25%. And so we have a major livelihood crisis. And of course that livelihood crisis necessarily feeds back into domestic demand. So what you're really seeing is a bit of a dead cat bounce in, I would regret to say, certainly in India and to a similar extent also in Indonesia. So we tend to confuse aggregate GDP growth with a, a, a sort of you know, more sustainable and sustained trajectory, which could actually proceed on its own terms over time. This is not what's happening uh, in, in, uh, in India or in those countries that are doing relatively well. And in addition, we have this other problem, which was also alluded to, Jose Antonio mentioned it, and I think Jeff also, the food crisis. So it's not just that you had this massive increase in global food prices because of profiteering and speculation, as your report may, brings out very clearly, it isn't about supply shortages in either food or fuel. It's really profiteering and speculation in the financial markets. But we now find that global prices are back to pre-war levels. They're back to mid-21 levels, 2021 levels in the global markets. They have not fallen equivalently in most developing countries. And that's often because uh, these are currencies that have depreciated. Practically every developing country has faced significant depreciation, minimum 10%, often as much as, well, Sri Lanka is, I think, nearly 80% now, but often in the range of 20, 30%. It's also because there's a ratchet effect that we have observed 
even during the 2007-2008 global food crisis, that when the prices come down again, the global trade, they don't necessarily come down in the domestic trade. And that's because foreign exchange, food importing countries don't have the foreign exchange to import it. Anyway, their currencies have depreciated. There are fiscal constraints to achieving these sort of nutritional and social protection requirements that would be necessary in this situation. So the combination of the livelihood crisis, employment is down in many, many developing countries. Wages are down, money wages are down in many countries, combined with very high, sharply rising food prices and fuel prices, which as you know, as the universal intermediate, it's feeding into other prices. So it is stagflation that occurred well before stagflation was even thought about in the developed world. In fact, stagflation was evident in large parts of the developing world in early 2021 already, simply because of this combination of factors. So I would say that internal inequalities are playing a very big role. I mean, yes, GDP for some reason is going up in India. But it is GDP that is so heavily concentrated, not only between capital and labor, but within the capitalist class, you find it's, it, you know, profits, 90% of profits are accruing to a very small segment of employers, which is really those employing, you know, 500 to 1000 workers or more. And within that, to the top 20 companies, the top 100 companies at most. So we're seeing extreme polarization which cannot be a recipe for sustained growth. And of course, then we talk about the problem of climate. Once again, it is often talked about as if this is a problem of, let's say, small island economies or those that are directly at the front lines. In India, we estimate already around 50 million climate refugees within the country, because it's a very large subcontinent, which also has you know, coastal regions, regions facing desertification, regions facing flooding, regions facing earthquakes. We already have climate refugees, and this is true of many of the large economies. And we do not have either the fiscal space or the willingness to actually engage in these further. Essentially, uh, to, to do the fiscal kind of response that is necessary. In India, India and Mexico had the lowest fiscal expansion of all the G20 countries during the pandemic. And it's partly because of fiscal rectitude self-imposed and partly because of fear of capital flight. So once you're globally integrated, you, you're kind of losing out on all ways. Not only are you forced to raise interest rates when you really cannot afford to, and when it will devastate your real economy further, but you also have to actually prevent the kind of fiscal expansion that is absolutely essential. Clearly, as you said, you can't do this without some multilateral framework that doesn't force you into this terrible kind of lockdown. And uh, what to me has been a continuous surprise throughout this pandemic and actually even before is the absolute lack of enlightened self-interest among the rich countries. I mean, G7, I don't know what they're thinking because it, everything comes back to bite them, right? Yet you nonetheless get uh, all the things you've mentioned, you know, beginning with vaccine nationalism, the holding on to intellectual property rights when you really should not have the persistence of uh, you know, gra grabbing of whatever resources are available without being willing to share even a tiny 1% of the domestic fiscal expansion with other countries, preventing even a further expansion of SDRs. I mean, there's so much low hanging fruit out there. Jose Antonio will tell you about all the very obvious tax measures that would have raised hundreds of billions in global revenue, benefiting everybody except a few multinational corporations. None of these seems to be done. And so there's a, the absence of enlightened self-interest is for me, the biggest puzzle really in our global political economy today. Okay, thank you. I think that leads nicely into this question of, of what kind of changes we need at the multilateral level to begin to change course in the ways that you've all You've all suggested that. I, I mean, it's very easy, I think, to tell a story about the lack of trust, the lack of solidarity within the multilateral system, the, the asymmetries and the weaknesses that have been exposed, uh, particularly in the last couple of years. At the same time, we do see some positives. Like, I mean, the, the multilateral development banks who didn't really step up to the plate during COVID-19, but we had the SDR uh, allocation. 
Uh, we've got new windows being opened up in the in the IMF and you know the food resilience and sustainability trust. Um, uh, so there has been some positives on in in that respect. We we the COP even though the COP twenty seven got a, a fairly negative uh, 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 interpretation in the Western press, the loss and damage initiative was a very important step forward, particularly for developing countries, for the reasons that Jose Antonio. Uh, outlined uh, outlined himself. We've had the Black Sea Grain Initiative that UNCTAD was partly involved with. We've had the recent resolution in the UN uh, on on international tax uh, issues. I mean, there are these small steps, Jeff, that suggest at least perhaps the uh, uh, the right direction without really seeming to come to terms with these kind of big systemic problems that will lead that will require much more. Heavy lifting, I think, than 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 the proposals that we've 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 uh, heard about so far. Where, what's you? I mean, you you have yourself outlined a, a stimulus, a, an SDG stimulus package as a way of combining the short term problems with these more systemic challenges. Where do you what what do you want to see in terms of multilateral reform moving forward? Uh, I want to stick with the financial issues just for uh, <coughs> focus of the discussion. And to say that um, we're looking to shift an, an additional one to two trillion dollars a year to the low income and lower middle income countries. And to put that into context, that's one to two percent of world output, or roughly four to eight percent of global saving. Uh, we're a hundred trillion dollar world economy, roughly speaking, 25 to 30 trillion dollars global saving. So a trillion dollars is a manageable amount, but would make a very big difference for electrification, for children in school, for health systems, uh, for uh, safe water and sanitation and so forth. It's uh, a manageable amount. Um, it does not flow through the bond markets. It does not flow through the institutional investors. Uh, and I think the credit ratings are an important indicator and guide, as I mentioned, of the 82 low income and lower middle income countries, 79 do not have an investment grade credit rating. And that means that for a variety of institutional and fiduciary reasons, uh, the poor half of the world will not get market-based financing from uh, market-based institutions on terms that have anything to do with development. And by that, I mean maturities need to be 30 years or longer because development is a 30-year investment process or longer. Uh, the terms of borrowing have to be, as I usually put it to myself, no more than 200 basis points above the borrowing costs of AAA sovereigns in Europe or the United States. And so we need to think systematically about the real uh, financing. One point that I make, which is a little bit heretical, is I believe that this incremental financing could be debt financed. Uh, it would mean debt to GDP levels much higher than currently. But if the interest rates were really low, and if the debt was very long term, and if the interest rates were fixed rather than variable, there would be economic growth, there would be development, and what looks like a lot of debt would be quite manageable. Of course, it would have to be properly managed, but it would finance a lot of long term development and investment. So how could this be brought about? I think the main institution for this purpose is the G20. India is uh, president of the G20 starting on January 1. Brazil is president of the G20 in 2024. And South Africa, president of the G20 in 2025. I've also recommended adding the African Union as the 21st member of the G20, just as the EU is the 20th member of the G20. So many European countries have two seats uh, effectively, and Africa has only one country, South Africa, for uh, a population of 1.4 billion people. Uh, 
But the point is, these are the world's major economies. And for the next three years, they will be led by important countries in the developing world, in the middle income world. If we can't get this done during this period, it's pretty sad, frankly. Uh, I think the United States is generally deeply recalcitrant, but Europe much less so. The rest of the G20 is broadly cooperative. President Lula's election is a big deal for geopolitics, in my opinion, uh, because I like him a lot. And I think he will be very important for Latin America's voice uh, in the world as well. And uh, I view the United States as, as basically the big opponent of any fundamental reform. But I even think that's manageable. We're only 4% of the world population. There are plenty of important voices. Uh, and so I'm counting on the G20 actually playing an important role in the next three years. And I want us to play an important role supporting the G20. Think of the Troika so-called that will be leading the G20 starting January 1st. That will be India, Indonesia, and Brazil. Well, come on, let's make something of this uh, to really get substantial reform. What would it mean substantively just in one sentence? I'd like to see the development finance institutions globally operating at roughly 10 times the scale that they do right now. Uh, because if we put a trillion a year through the multilateral development banks and other development finance institutions, that would be manageable from the point of view of the recipient world. It would actually allow them to develop and to grow and to even service those debts in the long term, as long as these are long term loans at low interest. And it would not cost much in any practical sense to have this massive expansion of the balance sheet. So I want the Inter-American Development Bank and uh, the COF in Latin America and the African Development Bank and AIIB and Asian Development Bank and the New Development Bank and others to really step up their game and for the G20 countries to back them to do that. And for us to do the back of the envelope calculations with our Solo or Herod Doma or other models to show, you know, you could actually take on a lot more debt if it's long-term low interest and directed towards long-term development by investing in education, health, infrastructure, and so forth. And why not? Let's make the breakthrough this coming generation to end what we've been talking about for 40 years, uh, the end of poverty and uh, the end of uh, destitution. It's really within reach, but it requires the financing to do it. Do you think in that context, Jeff, just quickly, whether there's a case to be made for a new hip? I mean, given that the immediate stress that many developing countries are facing, is there a case for revisiting HIPIC? In, in in this century to, yeah, to so, clear the clear the boards if you like let, let me give an example very quickly argentina does not have a lot of debt but it has a massive debt crisis because no one in their right mind lends to argentina no one lends to argentina because it's likely to default it's likely to default because no one lends to argentina you know we're just in a bad equilibrium uh, but the debt isn't very high it's about 60 percent of gdp external debt even less so i'm not even i'm personally not focused on hippic and so forth though i was 20 years ago i'm actually focused on a debt financed supercharged investment-led growth framework and when countries come to the imf and world bank i don't want them to be told you can't borrow more i want them to be told you borrow 10 times more but it's 40 year loans, it's IDA terms or IDA plus terms, but it has to be invested in clean energy, infrastructure, climate adaptation and so forth. This is not the only way to get the investments. I'm a deep believer in historical responsibility on the climate emissions. So the new, uh, if there ever is a losses and damages fund, it should be, it, it should be financed by a levy on historical emissions of CO2 which would be easy to calculate and which the United States will jump up and down in opposition to forever, but it's the right thing to do. But normal debt finance, if, if 
African countries could borrow at triple A rating on 40 year loans. Believe me, they wouldn't sit without electricity, without school rooms, without uh, teachers and doctors. They would get on with development. And the one thing that is horrible in all my professional experience of 40 years is the IMF currently writes programs in which it is absolutely plain as day that there is no way to have development on the basis of a successful implementation of, of the program. And so our standard has to be you read the document and you ask, is this a development document? And the answer is no for almost all of the clientele of the IMF. There's too low investment to get out of the poverty mess and the environmental mess. It's clear, it's obvious. Even the IMF Fiscal Affairs Department knows it, but they don't implement a difference. So I want each country to come and get more financing, not less financing. And I don't think that even debt cancellation, if the debt were 40 years, low interest, not being amortized right now, not having to be rolled over, we wouldn't even talk about the debt burden. We would be talking about the financing challenge. And so that's why I don't want to get us trapped into 10 years of heated debate on debt cancellation, which I was part of for 25 years ago. I'd rather have us focused on an investment led growth scenario that can truly be financed because the terms of finance are good terms. Let me turn to Jose Antonio because I know he's under time constraint too. I mean, I mean, I'm sure that's a model you would approve of. I, I, and and Richard, I, and apologies, I have to jump because I have a, a, a seminar starting in two minutes, so I'll listen to the first okay, sentence. Yeah, thank, thank you very much. Um, mm. Jose Antonio, what, I yeah. mean, you would approve of that. What's the, what, uh, is there a strong regional dimension to that in terms of regional development banks as being a necessary conduit to kind of finance that kind of long-term investment strategy that Jeff talked about? And is Latin America ready to do that? But let, let me uh, start by saying that uh, I, of course, uh, hope uh, the, uh, <clears throat> the numbers that, that were provided by Jeff were, were uh, feasible. I, I don't think they are. I think we, we, we have to be more, more modest in, uh, in the objectives to but do something in that direction, let's say. Uh, you know, one thing, you know, the magnitude that he's talking about is, is not going to happen. So let, let me actually uh, say a few things that they can complement and actually uh, including uh, some debt issues. Uh, first, a new, issues, a new issues of a special drawing rights, uh, similar to the one that was done uh, last year, uh, it will be very healthy. Second, a capitalization of all multilateral development banks. Uh, this, by the way, in Latin America uh, means uh, uh, the Inter-American Development Bank, uh, which uh, should be capitalized. Uh, the, the U.S. Uh, is not clearly on board. Uh, so the, uh, as if they have 30% of the uh, vote, uh, it's essential that the U.S. should be on board. Uh, anyway, uh, so capitalization uh, to increase the, the financing by, by MDBs. Uh, third, some debt renegotiation strategies, uh, which could be intermediated by the multilateral development banks. Uh, so a, a framework that uh, is a, allowed for heterogeneity uh, in the way debt is treated, because not all countries require debt restructuring, <laughs> but some do. Uh, and that's pr it's probably more in low income countries than in, uh, in middle income countries, but some middle income countries uh, do. Uh, fourth, a, a, a more ambitious climate change financing uh, a, a, by, by a, including the, uh, you know, uh, reaching not only the uh, 100,000, uh, uh, $100 million uh, that have not been met uh, of the previous financing strategy, uh, but uh, also the, uh, the, the new ideas that were approved in the, the recent COP. Uh, and finally, uh, a, a more ambitious uh, tax cooperation uh, mechanism. I mean, the vote uh, uh, this uh, last week of the resolution on that uh, for the U in the UN Second Committee, uh, which should now go to the General Assembly, 
I think it's a step forward, uh, and, but it does require a strong collaboration uh, between the OECD and, uh, and the developing uh, world. Uh, anyway, so that's my my agenda. I, I, I think the G20 can play a role and the, the fact that the three developing countries that are going to, uh, to share the board uh, consecutively is an opportunity. Uh, but the, the G20 unfortunately has become weaker. I hope they, you know, they can become stronger. And I, as, uh, as, a, as well as Jeff, I, I have to excuse myself for, I have to leave now for other meetings. Thank you. Okay, I'm gonna leave, give the last word to Jaiti though, um, because, you know, I mean, I, I think, I mean, I, I think you would agree with a lot of what was said. There hasn't yet though been, I mean, we, li we live in a world of highly speculative financial flows and, all the programs that we've been discussing here are about shifting to a longer term investment horizon. But that seems very difficult in a world of highly footloose and mobile capital. I mean, you know, you've talked a lot about the importance of capital controls as part of any sort of stable international financial system. Where do we stand on that? And, and what, what more practically needs to be done to, to kind of make progress in that respect? Yeah, you're, you're absolutely right. And I, I, I would go with Jose Antonio in terms of the feasibility of, you know, the grand things that Jeff outlined. I'm also less optimistic about the fact that the leadership of G20 in the next few years is going to be various developing countries, because we know that G20, it really doesn't matter who happens to be the president. We know who the powerful players are. And unfortunately, too much of G20 recently has become rubber stamping what G7 decides. And ultimately, it's basically US and European Union who decide. So I, I think there is a problem. The problem is that we want and we recognize that you have to have multilateral solutions, you have to have international cooperation, but it's not happening, as I said. It, and despite the fact that it's so clearly in the self-interest of the people of all these countries. So what, do, what does the rest of the world do? What do people do? And I think increasingly it's going to happen. And some of it is already happening simply because of the way the sanctions have been imposed uh, in the Ukraine war and so on, that you're going to find countries charting their own path. And this is happening already in both trade patterns and trade finance. Many more, shall we say, innovative solutions are being found to get around sanctions and to do other kinds of trade. But I believe that we're going to see more and more of new kinds of, let's call it capital management techniques, since capital controls is often, you know, raises a red flag for many people. We are going to see many more examples of countries, especially middle-income countries, bringing in measures that regulate the flows of capital to a, some extent, because otherwise it's just too costly. It's just impossible to do anything. And similarly, I think we're going to find more unilateral moves on the tax measures. The very, very obvious tax measures like unitary taxation of multinationals and so on, for which the OECD process has been going on for nearly a decade without any resolution, we are going to find countries imposing their own taxes. And I think that's all right, because I think that's good insofar as it forces the multilateral discussion into a more progressive direction. And we're not going to get change otherwise. We're not going to get change from G7 unless they actually feel that it's going to happen without them. So. I'm a little more hopeful for regional moves. I believe that Latin America, as Jose Antonio described, with you know, the new pink or red sort of emergence of new uh, leftist political regimes, many countries in Africa also now looking, the African Union showed itself to be a, a really interesting and strong regional force during the COVID pandemic. Asia is much more complicated, but you're finding even in Asia, more countries are looking at, if you like, the third way, simply because the other ways are becoming far too rigid and limiting. Okay, great, thanks. I, I should add, I, I mentioned at the beginning, the second part of the trade and development report will be on regional options and solutions for technical reasons that's been delayed. So it'll come out sometime over the course of the next few weeks. So I would uh, ask people to get ready for that and to check out the UNCTAD website to see the kinds of options that we think are credible on the, in terms of finding regional solutions. 
we've we've gone past our hour mark. So let me thank everybody. Jeff and and Jose Antonio have uh, already uh, moved on. Jaiti, thank you uh, very much. There were and a couple of questions that unfortunately we don't have time for in responding to them. But let me thank everyone for uh, listening in. Let me thank Jaiti and and Jose Antonio and Jeff for uh, contributing. What is sure to be an ongoing discussion as we look for genuine multilateral solutions to an increasingly uh, fragmented and troubled world order. So thank you, everybody. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye.